The gas laws have applications in physiology, in scuba diving, in meteorology, in all sorts of areas. And of course, we study the gas laws in the chemistry lab. Uh, one of the gas laws that we would like to study is Charles's law, which sometimes is also referred to as uh, Guy Lussac's law, but we're going to call it Charles's law. And that's the effect of temperature on the volume of a gas at constant pressure. You know, uh, there are five gas variables, if you will pressure, volume, temperature, number of moles. Actually, there are four gas variables. And uh, if you're going to look at the effect of one on another, then you have to keep the other variables constant. So if in Charles's law we want to look at volume and temperature, then we have to be sure that the pressure is constant. And fortunately, we live in a constant pressure environment, atmospheric pressure, so we can do that pretty easily. And we have to keep the number of moles of gas in our sample the same. Otherwise, we would be looking at differences due to that. This is a very, very simple way to study Charles's law. It requires a syringe. And you can use any size syringe. Uh, I'm going to use a 30 milliliter syringe, but we've done this experiment with 10 milliliter, 30, 60 milliliters, and you get excellent results with any size. You can also study any gas that you'd like, and we're going to study air, but when we've studied this one, we've done all the different gases just to prove to students that, in fact, when we talk about the ideal gas law, well, that's what we mean, the ideal gas law and that the properties are independent of the nature of the gas. Now, the only thing special I'm going to do to this syringe, which is, after all, going to trap a small volume of uh, air or other gas, is I'm going to put a tiny bit of uh, vacuum grease. I just have some silicone grease. I'm going to just, and I've already done it once, so I'm not going to put too much. I'm going to put it right around the gasket here, just using a splint and just, just a very small amount. You don't want too much, but you need to be able to give it some lubrication so that the, um, it will move easily uh, at different temperatures. And what I'm going to do first is simply obtain a sample of gas, and I simply obtain a sample of air, and I want this about half full, so I'm going to get it. Can you see that pretty easily? I'm going to read off exactly what it is, um, but I've got about 15 milliliters of air in there right now. I am going to put this syringe tip cap on the end. What that's going to do is trap that volume of air in there. It's not going to let it out. It's also not going to let more air in. And what I'm going to do here is just kind of pull it out and let it return to its equilibrium position. And I'm going to set that down for just a minute as it returns to its equilibrium position. Actually, I lied. I'm going to push it in and out rather than pull. I'm going to push in. And what I want to do is get a good reading on that. And I'm reading it at the gasket. And I'm going to say that's 15.1. Um, OK? And the first thing I'm going to do is put it into my coldest temperature bath. Now, I would do this with five temperature baths. We may not do all five today, but I'll show you that you could. And this first one right now is at 9.2, and that's an ice water bath with salt. But let's read the temperature later. Um, so that's just our initial volume, uh, really at room temperature, not in a bath. What I'm going to do is place it in that bath, and I want to submerge it. You'd like it to equilibrate at that temperature. And normally, if I were doing this in a classroom with students, I would say to keep it in there for uh, about two minutes. And what I'm going to do is. As I, it, it stays in there pretty easily. Um, we'll talk just a little bit in that as it's in the first one. So it equilibrates a little bit so we can see uh, what the volume is after maybe two minutes. Um, Charles's Law is named after, let me get his first full name, Jacques Alexander César Charles. He was a professor of physics at the Sorbonne University. And he became interested, and this was in the 18th century, 1783. He became interested in gas, uh, the gas laws, not because he was a scientist, but because uh, he was interested in hot air ballooning, which had just started. The first hot air uh, balloon flight had taken place uh, in 1783. And a couple of years later, uh, Jacques Charles actually made the first flight in a lighter than air air uh, balloon, and he climbed to a height of 9,000 meters. And so he was in, interested in science and in ballooning and studied uh, gas 
laws and the uh, effect of temperature and pressure uh, on the volume of a gas. And at that time, you have to realize, you know, in the 18th century, uh, really there wasn't even a good temperature scale. And part of the reason, uh, and his work actually led to the development of a be better temperature scale as well, and better thermometers. Uh, that's the key there, is better thermometers to measure temperature. Um, when we think of uh, the effect of temperature on the volume of a gas, it helps for us to have an idea of what's called the kinetic molecular theory. You know, the physicists have their great theories, and, and it doesn't seem like we in chemistry get our great theories somehow, but we do have one. It's called the kinetic molecular theory. It's very, very important in a lot of areas in uh, chemistry. And the kinetic molecular theory basically says that all molecules are in motion, and, or all particles, because they don't have to be molecules, they could be atoms, and that the average kinetic energy of those molecules in motion is related to their temperature. That's the kinetic molecular theory. So the question is, what would happen if you cooled a gas down far enough? This experiment is nice because we can actually extrapolate to determine what absolute zero would be. And I want to read to you a quote from Lord Kelvin, he of Kelvin temperature fame. In 1848, he pr uh, proposed an absolute temperature scale based on the assumption that there must be a lower limit to temperature. Because remember, if you look at the Celsius and Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius does not correspond to anything on a physical sense other than the freezing point or melting point of ice and water. Right? Otherwise, in terms of molecules, it doesn't have a physical reality. And so Lord Kelvin was the first to propose that there should be a lowest possible temperature. And this is a quote from him. Infinite cold must correspond to a finite number of degrees of the air thermometer below zero. Since if we push the strict principle of graduation sufficiently far, we should arrive at a point corresponding to the volume of air being reduced to nothing. And that's what we're going to try to do in this experiment. We're going to measure the volume of the gas at five different te uh, temperatures. We're going to plot that, and we're going to see if we can extrapolate to where the volume of the gas would be zero. And according to Lord Kelvin, that should correspond to absolute zero. So you don't normally have too many experiments you can do in your classroom where you can actually measure absolute zero. It's pretty cold. So let's see uh, how we're doing here. The first thing I'm going to do, that's probably been a couple of minutes, or if I was very long-winded, maybe three or four. And the first thing I'm going to do is give you the uh, temperature here. And let's go with a temperature of minus nine degrees. Okay. What I'm going to do is just briefly take it out. I'm going to plunge it in, and then I'm going to see where it rests. Okay? And I want to overcome a little bit of resistance. And so without warming it up too much, I'm going to immediately measure the volume of that. And I'm reading 13.0. 13 13.0. .0. 13 .0. Okay. I'm going to push that in a little bit. And what I do, just to overcome the resistance, I'm going to put it in the second bath here, which is a simple ice water bath. You always want to start colder and warm up, because it's easier to warm up than it is to cool down. This was an ice salt water bath, and we're going to go here with a temperature of 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. I'm going to give that just, just a little while longer to equilibrate. I only need the sample of gas, obviously, in the uh, uh, bath, whatever the temperature of that bath is. What I'm going to do here, uh, that has equilibrated, we said that was at uh, 0 0.5 degrees, right? And we're going to go ahead and do the same thing. We're going to press that in. I'm just pressing it in until the limit uh, at which it doesn't move anymore. And I'm going to put that down here. So now I'm reading 14 milliliters, 14.0. But this is being very cooperative, don't you think, in terms of that? I have a room temperature bath here. The room temperature should be uh, pretty good. And I'll put that in there. And again, this part is easy. And what I like about doing this, now I've got to hold it in there just uh, a bit. Uh, when you're doing this with your students, I would recommend that you have them 
alter some of the variables so they're not all doing exactly the same experiment. Because if you do it that way, then you have the opportunity for some cooperative learning because they're going to have to share results. In other words, have some students use, uh, if you, depending on whether you have any other gas sources, most of us can certainly get methane gas, and you could use that as a source uh, from your natural gas. If you have a source of hydrogen, if you have a source of nitrogen, oxygen, you can generate the gases, collect them. There are some simple methods that we describe for uh, generating the gas and, and uh, basically uh, keeping it in a basically a plastic bag assembly and so on. So I would have different students try different gases to the extent that you can do that. I would certainly have them try different size thermometer, uh, different size syringes because I think that's important. Um, I like to do it with five different baths. Um, you know, usually when in a cooperative class experiment, you can then plot all of the data on one graph. In this one, you really have to plot each student's data independently. You can then plot many series of data on the same graph. But in order, because you're, everybody's starting with a different initial volume, you can't plot them all and then draw a straight line, which would be really nice if you could. Uh, this bath is at, I'm reading here, 23.8, which is room temperature. I didn't do anything to that. And again, I'm going to withdraw it. I'm going to push it in just until it really I feel a lot of pressure. I'm going to let it naturally go back. And that was the point of lubricating it. And we'll set that one down so we can read it. And that's 15.0 milliliters. And that's actually some, it's nice to know, a little bit of verification. There's internal consistency here. Because if you remember the 15.1, I measured that volume before I just, and in the room temperature air, before I had put it in any water bath. So we're at least internally consistent. Uh, let's see what, this one was hot tap water. And that's at about 36. But I think rather than do going to the 36, in the interest of time, I've got what was about 80 degrees Celsius water here. In doing this, I would not recommend going above 80, uh, just because of the syringe and the sample and so on. I want about the same volume there, which looks like it's about there. And we'll go ahead and measure what that water is now. I wrote, uh, before we started, I wrote, it, I wrote down what I wanted the approximate temperatures to be. I wanted this one to be about 75, and we are at, and I'll let it, it takes about a minute. And you know what, while I'm doing that, <laughs> that was quick, I'm going to push that in, take it out, and I'm going to go ahead and put it in there. So rather than do the intermediate temperature, we're just going to get four. And I'll show you what the data looked like with five different temperatures. Uh, this bath is at 71, no, uh, 70.8. Okay, I think that's probably about a minute. So, um, and we're, we're going to do time lapse there. So I'll just take it out and wrap it up. Okay, I'm going to take that out of the last one. And we read the temperature already. Is that correct? Yes, we did. So I'm just going to take that out. I pressed it in, and that's at 17 milliliters. We have a, boy, we were, and I, I'm not making those numbers up. <laughs> those were exactly 13.0. Let's plot these numbers really quickly here now. Minus 9 degrees, it was 13.0. Minus 9 is going to be here. Minus 9, 13? Correct. Minus 9. Minus 9. Minus okay, nine. 13. I have to keep repeating it. That's going to be right here. Okay. And then 0 0.5, it was 14. So 0 0.5 and 14. Okay. 23.8 at 15. We're going to go with, let's see, 10, 20, 30, 24. What did we say? What did you say? 23.8. And it was 15? 15. 15. Obviously, your students would do this on good graph paper or they would do it on Excel. But I just want to show you, even under these conditions, crude as they are, that we can get a good graph. And finally, 70.8 and 17. 60, 70, and 17? 17. 17. 17 at 70? 70.8. 
70.8, well, I obviously can't do that. Now, what you would do next is we said we were going to extrapolate to absolute zero. And the way you do that is we have four points up here. But what was absolute zero? Zero motion, infinite cold, where the volume of the gas should go down to zero. And um, fortunately, I have on the other side, I do have this. Now, let's just do it like that. And I'll show you what the... That's the very, very, very crude graph, okay? Uh, because obviously I, I'm not trying to get those points, and I said we didn't get the fourth point, but I'm extrapolating about minus 230. That's not that great. Let me show you uh, data that's obtained in the lab when you're letting everything go exactly when you're plotting uh, using a computer spreadsheet so that you can, you know, these are very crudely drawn. So we're going to flip that over, and uh, these are our very typical data. You can do this 20 times. You can do it, as we said, with all sorts of sizes and everything else. Those are our points up there. And when we extrapolate down, remember, zero volume should correspond to absolute zero. We get minus 270 degrees Celsius for absolute zero. The true value, of course, is minus 273.15. Notice how very far away all of our points are from down here. You could, of course, get better results if you could get some points in here. We're very far away. But even given that, and you can see that this particular line is an excellent line, uh, correlation coefficient of 0.99. That's a straight line, an excellent value to extrapolate down to absolute zero. A simple experiment, a way to measure something that otherwise you certainly could not measure, which is absolute zero. Charles's law, the effect of temperature on the volume of a gas. Thank you.